We at the Fig Tree would like to welcome you onto Lancaster's slave trade and fair trade town trail. Lancaster was declared a fair trade town alongside York during Fair Trade Fortnight in March 2004. In the mid 18th century, Lancaster was a prosperous transatlantic port with ships sailing to Africa for enslaved labour and to the Caribbean for the tropical goods that those enslaved Africans produced. Much of Lancaster's wealth came from this commerce. It is estimated that around 12 million Africans were taken from their homes across the Atlantic Ocean, 3.4 million in British ships, in the greatest forced relocation of people in the history of mankind. This tour will look at the slave trade in Lancaster during the mid-18th century and what Lancaster is doing to promote fair trade today. This is the Friends Meeting House on Meeting House Lane. The Meeting House is a place of worship for members of the Religious Society of Friends. Despite the fact that their faith was against the keeping of slaves, in the 18th century, many Lancaster Friends were Quaker merchants who, one way or another, profited from the slave trade. Quakers were prominent in the abolition of the slave trade. From setting up a central Quaker committee and a national network of local Quaker campaigners in the 1780s. Right up to the British transatlantic slave trade finally being abolished in 1807 and beyond with the abolition of slavery and the anti-slavery campaign today. One Quaker who profited directly from the slave trade was Dodgson Foster. He was a typical slave trade entrepreneur, but his sudden disengagement from the trade raises some interesting questions. Did Dodgson Foster wake up to the immorality and scope of the exploitation of which he was a part? Or was it because his Quaker slave trading partner died? Then again, Perhaps he simply gave up the trade after making his fortunes from it, deciding the risks were becoming too great. Despite Quakers profiting from transatlantic slavery in various ways, anti-slavery pamphlets were distributed in Lancaster by friends from this meeting. Other Quakers, however, refused to purchase or consume sugar produced by slave labour. Some Lancaster Quakers, like William Dilworth and William Jebson, also became outspoken opponents of the exploitation. Both men benefited from transatlantic slavery as sailcloth manufacturers, supplying canvas for ships and the colonies. Although perhaps not as obvious, exploitation continues in our world today, and Quakers are still an active part of the fight against unfair trade practice. <laughs> 
At that time, if you wanted to be a successful merchant, you had to establish your presence here. Lancaster became one of the busiest ports in England, after London, Liverpool and Bristol. The Gillow family profited from mahogany timbers, which would have been felled and extracted by enslaved Africans in the West Indies. The Custom House was where the profits from the voyages to Africa and the West Indies would be reckoned and import duties paid. The Custom House became Lancaster's Maritime Museum, which told the story of Lancaster's history as a port. Dolchin Foster's home and warehouse was next to the Custom House. This was a prime spot and was close to where his profits from slave trade exploitation would arrive in the docking ships. He continued to live and trade in slave-grown West Indian sugars after selling his slave ship, the Balbra, in 1758. He would still have been able to see slave ships departing from his window. At the end of St. George's Quay, this memorial lists some of the slave ships that sailed from Lancaster and the number of slaves each one carried across the Atlantic Ocean from Africa to the West Indies. Every man, woman and child can be numbered, but none of them named. Greed for profit was the greatest priority for merchants like Dodge and Foster. And the slave trade was necessary to ensuring a steady supply of affordable luxuries, such as sugar and rum. The abolitionists' message was that it is simply immoral that people should be allowed to suffer in order to provide us with luxuries such as sugar at a cheap price. That message is just as applicable today. Farmers who grow the cocoa for our chocolate may not even have access to clean drinking water. Money lies at the heart of this exploitation, with people being treated as mere commodities. <laughs> 
In sight of the memorial lies the home of Lancaster's Global Link. Global Link helped Lancaster, Morecambe and District to become a fair trade district. Here is where merchants and captains would meet up to trade and make all sorts of deals. And this is the place where Dodge and Foster sold his first slave ship, the Balbra, in 1758, after its successful slaving voyages to Africa. This site on Lancaster's green air was where the Brockbank family had their shipyard. They built ships for both the slave trade and the West India trade. It is now a Sainsbury's supermarket and it even sells some fair trade products. It was built to serve Anglican worshippers and to relieve the overcrowded Lancaster Priory Church and supported by benefactors who got their wealth from the slave trade and West India trade. Worshippers at St John's would have included merchants, ship owners and captains. Some of them, such as the Brockbank's shipbuilders, are buried in the churchyard. Ironically, or perhaps appropriately, the church was home to the Fig Tree International Fair Trade Center. John Nunns, who captained the last Lancaster-owned slave ship in 1807, is buried in Trinidad, but commemorated by a gravestone erected by his wife in St John's Churchyard. Today, in Lancaster, there are places that this fair trade city can feel proud of. William Lindo spent a good many years in the West Indies, where he traded slaves between the islands, exported slave-produced goods, and owned slave plantations. Also, living in this house was his servant, John Chance, who was a former enslaved African that Mr. Lindo brought back with him. Returning to the grounds of the Friends Meeting House, we find the final resting place of Quaker slave trader, Mr. Dodgson Foster. <laughs> 
It is very easy to judge Dodge and Foster using modern standards. But it's important to realize that he was not a criminal in his day. Everything he did was not only legal, but totally accepted by society, and indeed by the churches of that time. We now live in more enlightened times, where slavery is illegal. We have fair trade towns, and there is a growing consciousness about social and global inequalities. We may be more enlightened, but perhaps there are some things that we still do, however legal and acceptable, which remain morally questionable. Maybe in another 200 years, future generations will look back upon our actions and consumer choices and condemn them as immoral. Are we really any better than Dodge and Foster?